Now I'm going to um, invite our next panelist to the uh, um, the floor. Um, Bruce Party joins us. Bruce is a professor of law at Queens. Um, and um, bear with me, I'm going to pull up some bio here as uh, Bruce uh, comes to uh, join us. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Bruce. Uh, your camera is currently off. Okay. Um, uh, Bruce has taught at law schools in Canada, the United States, and New Zealand, practiced civil litigation in Toronto, and served as an adjudicator and mediator on the Ontario Environmental Review Tribunal. He writes for the National Post, Epic Times, the Brownstone Institute, among others, serves as a senior fellow to the Fraser Institute, McDonald laurier Institute, and the Frontier Center for Public Policy. Uh, I first heard Bruce on CBC before I couldn't listen to CBC anymore, having to do with the stop sop uh, uh, with the bencher election uh, a number of years ago, unmistakable voice and uh, and, a, and a fountain of knowledge on on these subjects. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Shannon. I'm not sure if I've been back on CBC since that time. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've listened to it since then. To be honest, what do you think of the of the presentation and, and the speakers so far? You've been with us uh, uh, since the beginning of the day. I have, yes, and and. So I'm thinking of what I'm going to say as a bit of a reality check, but it's not like the, the our, our audience hasn't had a bit of a reality check already. Although I expect that a lot of people on the line are familiar with all these problems, which is why they're with us. Um, but you know, it's all very it's all very sobering stuff, shocking but not surprising. I guess is the way that I would put it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm just going to put up a. A uh, share screen thing here. Yep. And I want to start with a uh, a quote that was contained in the video that Melanie showed us this morning. Well, I guess it wasn't this morning. It was early afternoon. No, nope. if yes. you're in BC, okay. it was this morning. Yep. Okay. We've got <laughs> people from coast to coast. So here was the quote. Somebody on that video said, parental rights are not a thing. They are not real. And the problem is, the legal problem is, that's largely true. Now, I'm talking legally here. I'm not talking morally. I'm not talking that we sh that parental rights shouldn't be a thing. They should be a thing. But if they weren't a thing, then provinces like Saskatchewan wouldn't need to pass parental rights bills because they would already be there. But they're not. They are not embedded in the system. And that's not surprising because of how we got here. So I want to ask this question. Why do we have a public school system? And I don't mean now, just, I mean from the very beginning. Why did we originally invent a public school system? And way back when, it was because, I think, that people thought that if you left children to their parents, they wouldn't get a proper education. You know, they'd be sent to the, into the fields or into the mines. They wouldn't be taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. And... Schools used to teach those things. But in other words, the premise, even back then, was that children should not be left to their parents to educate. And that is the same premise we have now. The curriculum may have changed, but the premise is the same. And if I can put it in crude terms, I think we should put it this way. Well, first, before I go there, let's just have a look at the Education Act of Ontario. I'm going to use Ontario references here, but the story is the same pretty much across the country. Every province has an Education Act of the equivalent. Every province has a Human Rights Code of the equivalent. This is what the Education Act of Ontario says. A strong public education system is the foundation of a prosperous, caring, and civil society. Now, what does that mean? It, it implies the following, 
that if you do not have a public education system, then you will not have a prosperous, caring, and civil society. In other words, if you leave children to their parents, you will not have a prosperous, caring, and civil society. Subsection two, the purpose of this school system is to provide students with an opportunity to realize their potential. Again, implication, if we don't have public schools, if you leave education to the parents, students will not get an opportunity to realize their potential. Parents are the problem. And finally, as we all know, there is a rule in these acts that say attendance is compulsory. Now that sounds like that rule is aimed at the students. And of course they mean the students have to go, but the rule is aimed at the parents. Here is what you must do. And so I'm gonna put it crudely, we have public schools and have always had them because parents are the problem. They're incompetent, they're ignorant, they might be poor, might be negligent, and they are oppressive. So it is not surprising that parents do not have rights because when parents come forward wanting to interfere in the way schools are run, this premise rears its ugly head. Now, a lot of people inside the schools might not even frame it this way, might not be aware of it, but it is deeply embedded. Parents should be should go away and let us do our job because we have the expertise. We know what we are doing, and parents, you do not, which is why we have schools in the first place. So, and this is all for the purpose of, of, of trying to help people think strategically about this problem. I think it's important that we see how the proponents of all of this see the situation. Here's how you might see it. You're envisioning you and your child as a unit and dealing together with schools. Schools, after all, are providing a service. And you want that service to serve your child. And you expect to be able to at least influence the schools on how they perform that service. That is not how the schools see it at all. Because of this premise, you and your child are not a unit. You and your child are two separate people. And they exist to help your child escape you. They see their function as stepping in between you and your child so your child can be educated properly because you are an obstacle to that goal. So when you insist upon dictating what books are in the library or what sexual education your child will receive or what the ideology is supposed to be, you are demonstrating to people in the schools that you are dangerous. <clears throat> now, yes, it's all based upon an ideology and it's based upon a curriculum that has grown up over the past you know, few years into a very strange place. But nevertheless, the premise still applies, which is the reason why the people who run the schools resist the idea that parents must have a role. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, of course. You know, we have parent, student, uh, 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 parent councils. We have um, all kinds of things that you might be able to do with your child. But what I mean is, in terms of running the school, in terms of influencing the curriculum, the policies, the teacher, the principal, there is great resistance and it makes sense that there would be because of where the schools have come from. So let's talk about human rights. I mean, you have human rights, don't you? Your 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 child has human rights, doesn't she or he? And the answer is, well, on paper. But the meaning of human rights is changing. So let's go back again. Where do human rights come from? What do they mean? So originally they were conceived to liberate people from the oppression of the state. 
you know, you might have included in the idea of human rights, the idea that you couldn't be locked up without a trial in terms of, you know, due process. You couldn't be tortured. And all these other kinds of ideas that would that would sort of draw a line between you and the oppression of state force. But today, that is not what human rights mean. They have been turned on their head. And human rights today, instead of being primarily applied against governments, as constitutional rights are, as in our charter, human rights today can be applied by one citizen against another. And in that sense, they have been weaponized. They become a zero sum game. And you are on the short end of that stick. And here's why. Here's the human, human the Ontario Human Rights Code. And as I say, there's one of these in each province, as well as a federal one. They're very similar to each other. Here's what the Ontario Code says every person, that is, every individual, has a right to equal treatment with respect to a whole list of things. And you're probably familiar with what those things are. And they include, of course, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and so on. But the idea here is that you and your child, having your human rights, should be able to influence or at least demand that you be treated equally by schools and, for that matter, by the healthcare system and so on. That is not how it's going. It's not going that way because there are two competing ideas about equality in the law. The words of the Human Rights Code reflects one of the ideas, but the other idea is taking over. The first idea is the idea you probably have in your head. And it's the idea that the word suggests, which is everybody, everybody, has a right to equal treatment, or if you like, equal protection, or if you like, a right to have rules applied equally. It's also called formal equality, sometimes called equality of opportunity. In other words, blind justice, we're all entitled to be treated the same way. Now, that might seem uncontroversial, and at a certain moment in time, it would have been but not today. Today, there is a different opposite idea. And that idea is not that everybody is entitled to equal treatment, but that some people are entitled to unequal treatment, that different rules and standards apply to different people to achieve the same or comparable burdens or outcomes. We call this equity or equal outcomes or substantive equality. Now note, there's a term here that can confuse. This term, equality of opportunity, can be used to denote one and the other. And unless you know the context, the person who uses that phrase might, be the, might mean the first idea and might mean the second. So we started off with the first idea. That was the idea that the Human Rights Code was intended to reflect. It's the way it's drafted. And instead, over time, that idea has been replaced by the second idea. Not completely, not in a black and white way, not suddenly, but in a gradual way so as to lead our human rights tribunal to make the, the following kinds of observations. Now, Peter's right. There are not very many cases across the country about transgenderism itself. But you can see the trend on the on the little bit we have and on and the cases on other topics. You can see what the trend is and how it's working out. Here is a case, a quote from a case not about transgenderism, racial discrimination. This is a case, a complaint brought on behalf of a white boy who applied to take part in a program and was denied because he was white and complained about discrimination. And the tribunal said this, an allegation of racial discrimination or discrimination on the grounds of color 
is not one that can be or has been successfully claimed by persons who are white and non-racialized. In other words, not everybody is entitled to be protected from discrimination. That now is not what the Human Rights Code means. Here's another one. Again, a complaint from a, a, a man, this time a not a transgender or gender non-conforming person. He was lodging a complaint because of alleged discrimination because of his, quote, male behavior. Seeking protection under the code for engaging in gender conforming, not non-conforming, gender conforming expression. That is expression that may be viewed as stereotypically male. Here's what the tribunal said. In my view, the ground of gender expression cannot reasonably be interpreted to protect the right of cisgender men to express themselves in ways that may be perceived to be stereotypically male. In other words, I'm sorry, this is not for you. The Human Rights Code is not for you. Now, what do they mean? What they mean is that the code has been taken over by the ideas of social justice, critical theory, critical race theory, and wokeism. And what, what, what I mean by that is the Human Rights Code and its powers and its rules now seek, instead of applying the same rules to everybody, now seek to engage in reverse discrimination so as to protect so-called vulnerable groups and flip what is sometimes referred to as the privilege pyramid. You may be familiar with that. You know the predictable people are on the top and the predictable people are underneath and they, just, they want to apply rules so as to flip that power dynamic around. In other words, in society, the theory goes, Every all relationships are based upon oppression. And if you are an oppressor at the top of the pyramid, then it's not possible for you to be discriminated against. Instead, only those on the bottom are able to complain. Here's another one. This is a another tribunal case, a uh, complaint about a classroom situation in which the teacher was teaching some of the kind of material that has been talked about today and made a statement that there is no such thing as girls and boys. Now, the tribunal found that this was not discrimination against the, the complainant was on behalf of a, of a girl. It does not distinguish between boys and girls and therefore does not result in the erasure of one group as opposed to another. So this is kind of... Um, It's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a cheat, right? The statement that there is no such thing as boys and girls, of course, does not distinguish between boys and girls. That's the point. There's no such thing as those two categories. In other words, gender is a spectrum. And the complaint that you are, by that statement, eliminating my belief that I'm a girl has been dismissed here because it does not distinguish between boys and girls. And of course, the tribunal goes on again to say uh, the make an observation in the same kind of respect that I referred to earlier, which is that the protections of the code for cisgendered persons is not the same as for transgendered individuals. Why? Because transgendered persons are a historically disadvantaged group who face extreme social stigma and prejudice in our society. So they have the right not to be discriminated against, but you don't. And so look, let's look at the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Peter's observation that these policy statements from bodies like the commission are not formally binding in the sense that they're not an enactment of the law is quite true. Yet, they are very influential. 
and the tribunal, when they hear cases, have reference to these things. And it is a role that they have in their statutes. So they are not irrelevant. Here's a couple of things that the Human Rights Commission says about gender identity and gender ex expression. Trans people should have access to washrooms, change rooms, and other gender-specific services and facilities. Now, you see how this is now becoming a zero-sum because if trans people have access to washrooms of that nature, then those washrooms and change rooms are not able to be designated for girls who were girls at birth. You can't have it both ways. Either they're open access or they're not. Organizations should design or change their rules, practices, and facilities to avoid negative effects on trans people. Okay, Not that they should change their rules or practices with respect to cis people. I don't like that word, but nevertheless, you know what I mean? But only for trans people. And of course, organizations are liable for not accommodating a trans person's needs. Not a non-trans person's needs, but a trans person's needs. It's a zero-sum game. And in the case of the Ontario Human Rights Code, some of this has even been codified. This is section 14 of the same act that I read from before. This is, if you like, the codified exception to what appears to be a universal right against discrimination. A right not to be discriminated against is not infringed by the implementation of a special program designed to relieve hardship or economic disadvantage or to assist disadvantaged persons or groups to achieve or attempt to achieve equal opportunity. There is that phrase, equal opportunity. In this case, means equity, means substantive equality, means equal outcome. Now you think, okay, well, this is like affirmative action. Sure, and we have affirmative action exception even in our charter. And we've had affirmative action programs for a long time. So, okay, but it goes on. In section 1410. So section 14, one says, okay, you can put together a special program. If you really need to do this on a particular occasion, you can put a program together and we'll tolerate it for, you know, for that time. But 1410 says, oh, by the way, even if you don't actually have a program, even if you're just doing discrimination against that group on behalf of that group, well, then that's going to be okay. Even if the program has not been designated as a special program, the tribunal can find that it's fine. In other words, that guarantee that I read out to you in section five, that everybody has a right to be free from discrimination, in effect now is not true. Not if you belong to the wrong groups. So, what are we to make of this? It means that you and your child together, thinking that you can use your human rights to get fair treatment from schools and for that matter from the healthcare system, are proceeding on a false premise. It looks more like this. You are separate from your child. And the school system and the healthcare system and the human rights regime are there to protect your child from you. Let's go further. Here's what's happening. I mentioned this privilege pyramid where some groups are on the top and oppressors and other groups are on the bottom and they're being oppressed. You and your child are separately on that pyramid. And here's where you are. You are the oppressor. Your child is the oppressed. The role the institutions think that they have is to protect your child from your oppression. And so when you come along and say, well, you can't teach my kid about that, you are demonstrating that you are dangerous because they are proceeding on a set of, of, of ideas that is embedded in a certain ideology, and they are the ones in control. They 
genuinely think that this is their job. Now, I've included healthcare there for a reason. And the reason is this, that healthcare is part and parcel of this trans transgenderism phenomenon. But it's also relevant to other kinds of things like, like vaccines. And some people are not aware. The, 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 the assumption I think that many people carry around is that as a parent, they have to give consent before their child is subjected to medical treatment, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's puberty blockers, whether it's a program or a plan, whether it's a diagnosis, that the medical system won't engage with their child until you've signed off. Now, sometimes in practice, that's true, but it's not part of the law. The law says this, a person, and a person is not just an adult. A person is a person of any age. A person is capable of giving consent. If the person is able to understand the information that is relevant and able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of a decision. Okay, well, that sounds fine because, you know, your 12-year-old is not capable. And you know that they're not because they do all kinds of crazy things and you know how they think. And so you think, well, it's fine because he's not going to be fit in that category. Here's the problem. That's not your call. That's the health practitioner's call. And the statute goes on to say, a person, child or adult, is presumed to be capable. Furthermore, that healthcare practitioner is entitled to rely on the presumption. So if your healthcare practitioner in the school or wherever evaluates the child, talks to them, has a conversation with them, and it judges whether or not they think they're mature enough and intelligent enough to understand the consequences of the decision that they're making to get or not get a vaccine, for example. And that healthcare practitioner turns out to be wrong. Then that healthcare practitioner is not liable, which means that you actually don't have the kind of protection that you think. So maybe I'll maybe I'll I'll just stop there and just say a few concluding uh, a few concluding thoughts. You need to have parental rights, but you don't. And it's 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 no good to pretend that you do and insist that you do when you actually don't. The document that Peter was taking us through is, as he was saying, a very reasonable document. But my take would be that this is not the kind of issue that is going to be resolved reasonably. Because the folks who are in charge of the institutions don't want to resolve it in that way. They are in control and they believe that their role is to protect and educate your kids from you. And the compromise that suggests that you should have a role, that you should be informed, that you should get consent, that the whole thing should be under your supervision, runs completely up against that idea. You can't be the oppressor if the oppressor is being given a role. That defeats the whole project. And so in a way, what we need is legislative reform, but... You know, that that may or may not happen. It may be happening in Saskatchewan. The, the prospect for that, I can't predict. Maybe it's possible. I don't know. But before that happens, the more important thing is that you get an overwhelming rejection on behalf from, from, from parents in the jurisdiction in which you live who basically say, this will not do and cause the powers that be an enormous political problem. You got to have that. Otherwise, I think things are pretty much going to carry on as they are. There'll be a whole lot of window dressing, perhaps, to, to appease, but you're not really getting at the core of the problem. The core of the problem is the premise, and the premise is that parents don't know what they're doing. I'll stop it there. Wow. Uh I'm sure that 
our our attendees are going to watch that presentation a few times, Bruce. I know I am. Um, yeah, I'm naively optimistic sometimes, and uh, you just gave me a serious reality check. I have a question from Kathleen Lowry. Sure, uh, a couple of them actually, and and, and uh, I think maybe I'll read them both and and share. Uh, uh, what's the standing of decisions made by human rights tribunals? Is is there a tribunal of tribunals? Like the way there is, uh, is there a way for the Supreme Court to review some of these things? We know that these is, these bodies are quasi constitutional, if, if that's the right uh, description. Uh, you know, is there is are there some checks and balances for these non elected bodies? Well, so when you get a, when you get a decision from one of these tribunals, uh, one thing that you can do is you can take it to a court for a judicial review of the decision. But that is not the same thing as an appeal. The, the, the law that that reviewing court will apply is very lenient. In general, what it will do is consider whether or not the tribunal's decision was reasonable. And what they mean by reasonable is not that they think it's a good decision. They mean that within the boundary of the statutory authority that the tribunal has is the decision so outrageous as to have no rational basis whatsoever that we have to quash it. If that's not the case, well, then we're going to defer to it and let it go. So it is it is much less effective than an actual appeal, and it is certainly much less effective than starting again inside a courtroom. Um, people think, I think, that there are robust checks and balances on this system, and I would suggest to them that there really are not. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's going to take me a while to digest that, Bruce. Uh, really uh, important presentation. Uh, and, and I believe it gives a lot of parents and grandparents who've tuned in across the country to, to you know, listen today and, and to learn from what people are doing and, and experts like yourself. Um, now, one thing I didn't cover uh, but is also relevant is that we also have, as people will, will know, um, a, a charter section that guarantees equality. And that's another story in and of itself. But essentially, the, the, the story there, the trend there is pretty much the same. That section in the charter appeals, uh, appears to give all of us the individual right to be free from discrimination, just like in the Ontario Human Rights Code. But the way the Supreme Court has interpreted that charter section over the past almost 40 years essentially has ended up basically in the same place, requiring equality of outcome between groups. So we need to keep uh, getting politicians' attention like we did last year. No doubt. Wow. Um in the interest of time, I, I know there's, I mean, I, I've got tons and tons of questions, Bruce, uh, but in the interest of time, I, I think I need to move on because we, we have yeah. a panel presentation. Yeah. Um, this is incredibly valuable. I'm very grateful that you shared your time and your expertise today. Um, and you give us, you give us tools for this uh, in, in the upcoming engagement uh, and, you know, plans to, 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 make this a bigger public issue uh, this year than last. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, thank you very much, Shannon, for having me. I, I appreciate the invitation to, to to chat. If I had to part with a, with, a, with, a, with a last thought, it would be that I think it's important in this kind of project to try to think strategically as opposed to morally, because the moral suasion doesn't work with people who fundamentally disagree with you. So think strategically. That is a that is great advice. It makes a lot of sense in uh, and contextualizes for us. I think a lot of back channel discussions we've been having over the last couple of weeks that it's strategic as opposed to uh, moral. Very much appreciated, Bruce. Thanks, Sean. Wise last words. <laughs> Talk again soon. Okay.